So, um, with that in mind, so to before getting too far into it, okay, so you know the story, so I don't want to go too far. What this book is, is it basically starts where Mary Shelley stopped, okay, picks up a few years later, um, and kind of looks at the whole Frankenstein story and ends that way. So the main character is uh, Edward Frame, who's a kind of sleuth of the times. So this is early 1800s. And he's been tasked by uh, Henry Clerval. Okay, so this is the Frankenstein pop quiz. Remember Harry? <laughs> Henry Clerval? All right. Did he die first? Did he die second? Did he die third? It's a question. He's alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the one of the victims of Victor Frankenstein's uh, monster is Henry Clerval, Victor Frankenstein's best friend. And so, what I uh, the way this the story starts is Henry Clerval's father is a little trying to figure it get his head around the idea in the early 1800s that his son's best friend has stitched together <laughs> a monster who has then killed his son. Okay, so Edward Frame has been asked to go and check all this out. So what I thought was I would just read you the, the, the I mean, you'll hear a lot of this again, sorry, I didn't dive in at all, I lied. Um, the first, uh, the book is epistolary, um, so it's journals, letters, that kind of thing. So this is the the first entry by Edward Frame, who keeps a journal throughout of what he's investigating. And so this is his first entry, the first time you see him, and it, then it tells you about the rest of the book. Is that fair? Okay. So, Edward Frame's journal. Was a human-like creature truly brought from death to life, and did it commit multiple murders? My profession is one that has presented me with numerous strange and seemingly fantastical situations but I have never before met anything to compare with this. I have not yet begun the investigation, and yet already the details of this case are complex and contradictory. I shall keep this journal both to document that which I discover as well as to record my thoughts as they evolve. The journal will function as an aid to help me record and decipher the many facts I am certain to gather. The facts must be observed and then recorded and the truth revealed from them. I have read the passages of Robert Walton's narrative and admit I am baffled by it. With his writings, Captain Walton presents himself as an educated and thinking man. The story he relates gives the appearance of being true. Captain Walton's journal, which describes much more than the murder of Mr. Clerval's son, Henry. The journal recounts in detail the life and exploits of Victor Frankenstein, a brilliant but disturbed gentleman who believed he had actually created the murderer. Frankenstein's story is told in Robert Walton's journal describes how he came upon the answer to the source of human life and then, using body parts stolen from, the, from graves, put together a body and brought it back from the dead, bestowing life, animation upon lifeless matter. What am I to think of this strange story of a young scholar? According to Victor Frankenstein, that which he created was a monster in all ways and was responsible for the death of not only Henry Clerval, but of Frankenstein's youngest brother, William, and of Frankenstein's bride of yet a few hours, Elizabeth. To these could be added the execution of an innocent girl, Justine Moritz, who went to the gallows convicted of having murdered her uh, young, young William. <coughs> The story is presented as the true final words as Victor Frankenstein is told to Captain Robert Walton, both gentlemen of some consequence. Victor Frankenstein's tale cannot be rejected at this early stage, but it is hard to give it full credence. The concept is unreal and has an elements of more, more akin to a story told to frightened children. The truth behind these murders must have remained with Victor Frankenstein, but he is dead. The Victor Frankenstein carefully pieced together parts from corpses, 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 sorry, corpses, and then infused a spark being into lifeness that lay at his feet is the most perplexing idea. It requires examination before complete rejection. This idea astonishes and concerns me, yet intrigues me nonetheless. Already I wonder if, it, if to believe this story is to believe in a sort of madness. 
The very idea of bringing life to the dead is madness. I have witnessed a lifeless body pulled from the cold Thames and taken to a receiving station of the London Society. Some of the work had the semblance of the miraculous and wonderful as they resurrected victims from, the, from death by drowning. By the use of smelling salts, vigorous shaking, electric shocks, and air forced into the lungs by the resuscitation bellows tips forced past the lips, victims of drowning were frequently restored to life. Yet even those valiant attempts were not always met with success, although their patients were one whole human body as created by God. Lifeless for mere minutes, not many body parts taken from the long dead and stitched together by a man. To make a being from various parts of others and then give life to it seems more than fantastic. The creation of life is nothing short of miraculous. Every day babies are born who grow into adults to fulfill their role in life. Mothers are given the blessing of bringing life to their children, even if at the cost of their own lives. And here, Victor Frankenstein presents himself as a creator of life. He claims to do more than resuscitate a victim of drowning. He claims to create life from death. If there be any truth to his story, at what great cost and how miserably did he succeed? He created a monster where he hoped to bring forth life in all its beauty. How disappointed he must have been to be burdened with an unlovable and motherless child he could not control. Did Victor Frankenstein find out that life was not necessarily the only result of experiments, for truly by bringing life he also brought death? Were it not for Captain Robert Walton's recording of having both seen and spoken with the monster, I would dismiss this case as the manifestation of the unwell mind of Victor Frankenstein. Indeed, there is much to persuade me that the monster itself was a phantom, the direct result of some debilitating brain fever suffered by Frankenstein. Robert Walton's testimony in the form of his journal, however, provides evidence that at least one other person, and perhaps some of his crew as well, witnessed the existence of this monster. There must be others who saw the monster, for the description provided by Victor Frankenstein and Robert Walton of its inhuman size and frightful appearance, the monster could scarce have gone about unnoticed. It will be incumbent upon me to discover other witnesses by traveling to the destinations visited by Victor Frankenstein and speaking with those who met and knew him. This is an almost impossible case. Years have passed since the murders occurred. The trail to the murderer could be all but erased. Witness memories will have grown dim with each passing day, and some may have gone their own, to their own grave. Material evidence, if overlooked initially, will likely have been discarded or destroyed in the interval. I will have to call upon every ounce of my being and rely strongly on everything I've learned and observed up to this moment. I do not know that I will succeed. Never before have I been offered such a daunting task. Thank you.